Well, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the eighth presentation of the CFI Thinking Differently speaker series. My name is Barb Spurrier, and I have the privilege of serving as the Associate Administrator of the Center for Innovation, and the very special honor today to welcome you to our talk. We began the speaker series and our Transform Symposium, which is held in September each year, uh, really with the acknowledgement that a thinking differently mindset and capability is essential in our quest for innovation and transforming the delivery and experience of health and healthcare. External thought leaders inspire us about what's possible, help us think differently, and broaden our perspectives. We are so fortunate that Dr. Tashi Yamada is here with us today to do just that. But more on Dr. Yamada in just a moment. First, I'd like to share the format over the next hour. It will feature a presentation on lessons from global health by Dr. Yamada, followed by a conversation on the stage with Dr. Nicholas LaRusso, and we'll conclude with questions from you, our audience. We do ask that you wait until a microphone is brought to you prior to asking the question so we can be assured to have it recorded, audio recorded. We have a few microphones that will be uh, circulating. Dr. Yamada will then be available after the session from 1 to 1.30 to answer any additional questions you may have. You can just come up front here to meet uh, Tashi. Well, Dr. Nick LaRusso is well known in our Mayo community, having served as the chair of gastroenterology and hepatology, the chair of the Department of Medicine, the medical director of the Center for Innovation, an endowed professor, a distinguished investigator, and the list goes on and on and on. It's particularly fun today as Nick and Tashi have been colleagues and friends for many decades, and both definitely share this mindset and phenotype of innovation and thinking differently. So now on to our guest. Dr. Tashi Yamada is Executive Vice President and a board member of Takeda Pharmaceuticals. He has responsibility for research and development activities and heads the Global Leadership Group. He was formerly president of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Global Health Program. And in this capacity, he oversaw grants totaling over $9 billion in programs directed at so many of our challenges in the world, applying technologies to address major health challenges of the developing world, including tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, other infectious diseases, malnutrition, maternal child health, and such. And before joining the Gates Foundation, Dr. Yamada was chairman, research and development, and a member of the board of directors at GlaxoSmithKline. Dr. Yamada was born in Japan, completed his education in the United States. He graduated from Stanford University with a BA in history, obtained his MD degree from New York University School of Medicine. After completing his internal medicine training at the Medical College of Virginia, he became an investigator in the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. Trained in gastroenterology at the UCLA School of Medicine and assumed his first faculty position there. He later moved to the University of Michigan where he ultimately became chair of the Department of Medicine and physician in chief at the University of Michigan Medical Center before joining GlaxoSmithKline. A scientist and a scholar in gastroenterology, Dr. Yamada is the author of more than 150 original manuscripts on the subject and is the editor of the textbook of gastroenterology, which is now in its fifth edition. The studies undertaken by Dr. Yamada and his collaborators led to basic discoveries in the post-translational pr processing and biological activation of peptide hormones the structure and function of receptors for hormones regulating gastric acid secretion and the regulation of genes. In recognition of his contribution to medicine and science, he's been elected to membership in the Institute of Medicine, of the National Academy of Sciences, 
the Academy of Medical Sciences, and the National Academy of Medicine. He has received an honorary appointment as Knight Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire and has been conferred degrees from the University of East Anglia, the University of Warwick, Washington College, Loyola University. I mean, the accomplishments are amazing. He has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Distinguished Achievement Award in Gastrointestinal Physiology from the American Physiological Society, the Distinguished Faculty Achievement Award from the University of Michigan, the Distinguished Medical Scientist Award from the Medical College of Virginia, and the awards and recognitions go on and on. Dr. Yamada is a fellow of the Imperial College of Medicine, a master of the American College of Physicians, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, a past president of the Association of American Physicians, and the American Gastroenterological Association. He's also been a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So we are so incredibly honored that Tashi is with us today. As mentioned, he'll share his remarks on lessons from global health, followed by a conversation with Nick on the stage, and then open it up for your questions. Thanks for joining us, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Tashi Yamada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I was, <clears throat> I, I was thinking that the first time I came to the Mayo Clinic was almost 30 years ago now, um, where there was a, an international symposium on gastrointestinal hormones. Uh, I remember then <clears throat> that the Mayo Clinic was placed in a bunch of farms and fields. Today, I see the Mayo Clinic is is in the middle of a sea of white. Um, it was very, very reassuring to see that the hospital and the medical center continue to grow in this environment. I'm really delighted to be here. There are many things that I thought about uh, in, in coming here and, and, and trying to relate some experiences that I gained when I worked in the global health arena <clears throat> amongst many other things that I've done in my career. The Mayo Clinic is, is obviously a, a very special place. It, uh, it's been the fountainhead of new developments in science and clinical practice that have made life better for many, many people uh, in this country and in other parts of the world. But as you may well appreciate, more than three quarters of the world has no access to these wonderful technologies or these wonderful discoveries. The world is a very, very unfair place with great inequity in that just millions and millions of people who could benefit from today's technologies have no way of even thinking that they would be able to benefit from them. Now, I worked at a foundation, Gates Foundation, for five years, which was a great experience for me. Uh, let me just tell you how I got there. I was working at GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, <clears throat> I was actually working at SmithKline Beecham. And at the time that Glaxo Welcome and SmithKline Beecham merged, I realized that Glaxo Welcome was a very important, the largest manufacturer of antiretroviral anti medicines for HIV. We all know, of course, the incredible contribution that these discoveries made to a problem that was a scourge of the universe at the time. But in the year 2000, when SmithKline Beecham and Glaxo Welcome merged, our company sued the government of South Africa and Nelson Mandela himself over the pricing of HIV medicine. Now, you have to understand that at the time, uh, the, in the black African population in South Africa, the prevalence of HIV was 25%. <clears throat> 
So the idea that a company, a rich company, would sue a, a relatively poor country over the pricing of medicines which were desperately needed to survive as a country and as a society was obviously very, very abhorrent to me. <clears throat> I wondered what I was doing in the company and wondered why I should keep working there. But I was on the board of directors of the company and I decided that there was one thing I could do is just to change the company from, from the top. And, and so I went to the board and said, you know, we, we can't be a company that, that works this way. We have to be a company that makes medicines for people who need them and be able to supply those medicines to those people. One of the things we were able to do was to set up a laboratory that focused just on medicines for malaria and tuberculosis. And that was a great laboratory. We initiated the funding of this laboratory out of the R&D budget, that, but we, we implored the people who worked there to be entrepreneurial and find additional funding. And they were able to do so through grants and partnerships with the Gates Foundation and also with what were called product development partnerships that the Gates Foundation had set up. After a couple of years, I went to visit the Gates Foundation <clears throat> to talk about our programs. And there, at the end of my discussion, they asked me if I wouldn't stay and help them with what they were trying to do. It was a proposition I couldn't refuse because in the short time that I interacted with Bill and Melinda Gates, I could see the sincerity of their commitment to the concept that all lives have equal value and that they were willing to put the entire resources at their disposal to addressing this issue of inequity. Now, what did I, turn, what did I learn in my time with the Gates Foundation that would have relevance to me now as uh, somebody who's trying to make new medicines? and would have had relevance to me when I was an academic physician at the University of Michigan. I learned some very important principles, and perhaps I can go through them one by one. The first is a sense of urgency. Now, it's, it's very easy to talk about urgency. You know, as a clinician, you do feel urgency from time to time. I, I know, for example, one night when I was colonoscoping a patient that was bleeding out from his colon and I had to try to find the bleeder and was swimming upstream in a pool of blood, I felt a sense of urgency. And I can tell you, uh, I was drenched with sweat when we finally were able to cauterize the bleeder. But it was very different. Perhaps another sense of urgency is when you're when you have a site visit from the NIH, when people are going to review your grants and you're up all night the night before and you have no idea what the questions are going to ask. The first time I went to the field in Africa, I had a completely different sense of urgency. And, and that was uh, in southern Mozambique. I, I went to uh, a small clinic, sub-district hospital um, in a town called Manhisa. Uh, it was really the middle of nowhere. And in this town, <clears throat> there was this small sub-district hospital, they call it. It was not really a hospital in any sense like this. It was just a series of Quonset huts and tents. And there was an intake area, and, and I could see a mother sitting there with a child. <clears throat> and the child it was very sick, you could see. Um, I thought the child would have to be admitted. Between the time that I walked through the intake area and saw several other parts of the hospital and got to the pediatric section of the hospital, I could see the mother and child had been admitted. But this time the child was breathing at about 100 times per minute. And you can't sustain that for very long. And it was very clear that this child was going to die. And I thought about why this child was dying. The diagnosis was malaria. 
But if one of your children got malaria, they wouldn't die. Now, this child had had a lifetime of malnutrition, of repeated infections, of really uh, horrible deficiencies in dietary nutrients, of all kinds of suffering of one kind or another. And you realize that this is happening seven million times each year to children who are dying unnecessarily or from problems that could be prevented or treated. Then you gain a real sense of urgency. I never felt anything quite like this because I knew that the things I could do could have a, an influence on this. So now I want to fast forward <clears throat> to a challenge that we had at the Gates Foundation. We had set up this uh, alliance called the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, Gavi. And we had funded this alliance to the tune of a billion and a half dollars at the start. And we were spending up to a half a billion dollars a year for a few years to get it going. And this organization was hugely successful, providing vaccines to children all over Africa. Just the idea, if you take, for example, measles, two and a half million children were dying from measles each year in just before the year uh, uh, 2000. And, and last year, fewer than 250,000 children died from measles. And the cost of the vaccine for measles, which gives you lifelong protection, is six cents per dose. So small investments can make a huge difference, save many lives. And Gavi was one of the most important instruments for saving those lives. And during the course of Gavi's 10-year existence, it's estimated that some 8 million children were prevented from dying because of their vaccines. But we faced a crisis in 2010, 10 years after the Gavi was set up, in which the organization was mismanaged. They were spending a billion dollars a year and gaining only $300 million a year in donations. It didn't take a lot of arithmetic to understand that they were going to go out of business. And when we discussed this, one of the great joys and uh, pains of working at the Gates Foundation every day for me was I got to see Bill Gates almost every day. And I'll talk, you, talk to you about the joys and also the pains. But <laughs> we talked to Bill about the situation that was happening in Gavi. And of course, the Gates Foundation's reputation was very much at stake here because we had set up Gavi. And we talked about the situation and all the problems that were getting in the way of us fixing this problem. So Bill said, OK, I understand. What is your, what is your triage plan? I said, what do you mean, triage plan? He said, yeah, if you can't give vaccines to all the children, you tell me how you're going to triage the children that are going to get the vaccine and the children that aren't going to get the vaccine. By this time, his voice is almost at a screaming pitch. He said, you tell me who's going to live and who's going to die. That gives you a tremendous sense of urgency because you realize that your ability to fix this problem and fixing it fast would determine who would die and who would live. There are very few times in my life as a physician in which I had that power. But actually, it was over the death of 7 million children each year. And it is hard to conceive of it until you've seen one or dealt with two. And then you magnify that by seven million. You really feel a deep sense of urgency. 
To fix this problem, it was really difficult. 2008, the world economy crashed. The donors were dwindling away. Somehow, we convinced the British government to triple the donations to this, the Norwegian government to double theirs, the Gates Foundation tripled theirs. We increased the amount of money coming into the foundation to over a billion dollars a year for the next six years. Somehow, we were able to convince the pharmaceutical companies, GlaxoSmithKline in particular, with their rotavirus vaccine, to reduce their price by two-thirds. They would only do so on one condition, and that condition was that the Pan American Health Organization, which had a most favored nation clause in their revolving fund for vaccines, that they would relieve them of the responsibility of giving the Gavi price to the Pan American nations, such as Brazil and Mexico, which are very important business, business growth opportunities for the pharmaceutical industry. All this took a year. We also were able to have the chair of, the found, of, of this institution step down, and it was no easy task because the chair of the foundation was the former head of state of a very important European country. And we had the ability to ask the president, the CEO of this group, to step down. Many, many reputations were at stake. Many nights, people stayed up all night. Many different sessions in which Bill harangued us unmercifully. But the ability to walk away at the end of a year and understand that we'd solved this problem and every child that was eligible could have access to the Gavi vaccines was well worth the effort. Now, I think back to my own experience as a, as a caregiver. My mother had Alzheimer's disease. I remember the sense of desperation as she was slowly dwindling away, and the essence of her life was pouring out of her while she physically looked the same. And the urgency I felt, I somehow lost. It was one of the reasons why I went into the pharmaceutical industry, I know, because I thought I could make medicines for conditions like that. But you get working every day, you start doing the things you work on every day, whether you're a scientist in a laboratory uh, in, in a medical school or you're a scientist in a laboratory in industry, you lose that distance to the patient, and that distance somehow blunts your sense of urgency. I think you have to have that. You can't sit in a lab every day and not wonder whether what you're doing couldn't help somebody in the future. You have to connect to that patient, and when you do connect, you'll feel a sense of urgency again, and I think it will make you a much more productive person whose life every day will have more meaning. A second thing I learned is about innovation. We were dealing with problems such as HIV, TB, malaria. Let's take TB, for instance. The diagnostic test for TB is over 80 years old. There is a vaccine for TB that actually is almost 100 years old. Until last year, the last new drug for TB was more than 50 years ago that it was approved by the FDA. Somewhere along the line, something had to change. There had to be some true innovation if we were going to solve the problem of TB. There are hundreds of thousands of people dying for TB each year, and what you may appreciate is there are two billion people in the world today who have TB. 
Two billion people, a third of the people in the world have TB, and we have nothing to offer them. Well, we thought about this quite a bit, and, and I th actually, the whole idea of innovation is something that people talk about a lot. Every corporate logo has on it somewhere, we are the innovation company, or we're the innovation medical center, or we're the innovation university. But innovation requires more than just the logo. There's a difference between evolutionary innovation and revolutionary innovation. We have to go after that revolutionary innovation if we're going to understand meaningful solutions for very difficult to deal with problems. You know, I was a gastroenterologist. I still am. It's been a long time since I passed an endoscope. But I used to work on, on acid secretion. Why was acid secretion? Well, because acid secretion was very important in peptic ulcer disease, uh, interestingly enough. I, I think I got into it because I found out I had a peptic ulcer when I was 15. And in those days, I went to the clinic. Uh, this is, I was at a boarding school, the clinic, and the doctor said, well, I'm going to put you on atropine, and we're going to give you tincture, I mean, uh, it was tincture of belladonna, which was atropine. We're going to give you some phenobarbital, which will calm you down. And, and some people find it relaxing to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I was 15 at the time. As I got further into medicine, I realized that there are better ways to treat peptic ulcer. But, <laughs> but you know, what's so amazing is, as a gastroenterologist, the miracle drug was Tagamet, this inhibited acid secretion. When it was launched, it was a miracle. And what Tagamet did was that it decreased hospitalizations and surgeries for gastric resection or gastric surgery for peptic ulcer disease by about 95% within a couple of years. And if you looked at the OR schedule on any day in the 1960s, you would have seen the majority of cases would have been peptic ulcer cases. So this was a very important transformation, and James Black won a Nobel Prize for it. But one thing that we experienced was that every patient that we put on Tagamet, the moment we took them off the Tagamet, they got the ulcer again. So we weren't curing the problem, we were just treating it. There are these two scientists in Western Australia who are saying, oh guys, you don't, you don't have it right. It's not acid, it's a bacterium. You know, and I was what what was later termed part of the acid mafia, where we thought these guys were nuts. We often hated those guys because they kept showing up at meetings and <laughs> saying, oh, it's, not, it's not acid, it's, it's a bacterium. Well, to make a long story short, Warren and Marshall won a Nobel Prize for their, their findings that peptic ulcers are caused by the bacterium Helicobacter pylori. And if you rid the body of Helicobacter, you never had an ulcer again. So you could cure the ulcer. This was revolutionary innovation. The difficulty in life is that we know what we know, we, don't, we know what we don't know, but we don't know what we don't know. And true innovation, revolutionary innovation, is getting at this very difficult space of not knowing what we don't know and going into it headlong with solutions. So at the Gates Foundation, trying to find meaningful revolutionary solutions for things like malaria, TB, and HIV, we started a program called Grand Challenges Innovations. This was a really exciting program in which all you needed was a two-page application, no preliminary data required, just a creative, innovative hypothesis and a way to test it. And this could be applied to, say, new ways to, to treat malaria. And we had 
Unbelievable. I, by the way, <clears throat> if you got one of these grants, you got $100,000, and you could use that $100,000 over a year or two. And if you were successful, then you got a million dollars the next time around. And we had literally hundreds of applications for each cycle. We couldn't fund all of them. We only ended up funding maybe one in ten of the applications. But amazingly enough, they turned out to be very successful. Now, you know, you take malaria. We had exciting, innovative proposals from people who are Nobel Prize winners. By the way, this is all done by uh, an anonymously. And the review panel we had consisted of outstanding scientists. Over eight of the review panel were Nobel Prize winners. And we forced these guys to review 200 applications. And, and they would do it because, first of all, they felt they were doing something useful. And secondly, the application didn't take too long. It was two pages. A couple of minutes, you'd say, yes pile, no pile. Anyway, so we had, you know, to this problem of, of, of how do we deal with malaria in a creative way. Uh, Richard Axel, who won a Nobel Prize for uh, his odorant receptor work, had a project in which he hypothesized that the way that the Anopheles mosquito recognized you as food was through odorant, unique odorant receptors. He identified those odorant receptors, and he created a class of compounds that are not insecticides or repellents. They're called confusants. They actually confuse the mosquito so they don't recognize you as food. And I can tell you there's a very big German chemical company that's now making this product and testing it for, uh, for the marketplace. We had some sort of, you know, uh, proposals that actually took the world and turned it upside down. There was a proposal to prevent malaria transmission and the way that this would happen is that you would actually immunize the mosquito instead of immunizing the human. And there was, a, there was an antigen in the mosquito uh, intestine that is important in the translocation of the okinete from the mucosa into the circulation of the, of the uh, mosquito. And by immunizing humans against this antigen, the mosquito would suck up the antibody when, he suck, when, when the mosquito sucked your blood, and then the antibody would passively immunize the mosquito and prevent the translocation and therefore break the cycle of the malaria parasite. That's a really creative proposal, and that's actually going forward in, in clinical testing. There's a phase two program started on that very soon. We had some others that were just very simple but very elegant. Uh, one of the things that happens when the mosquito sucks up your blood is actually um, forms an iron complex inside from the, from the heme. And <clears throat> what this proposal suggested was that if you take a person and and, and apply uh, uh, some uh, a certain radio frequency, you could cause this uh, this this iron pigment to vibrate at a point where it would induce programmed cell death in the mosquito. So the whole idea here was that you would take a town of people, set up an airline security counter. Um, and, and have the right frequency pass people through the this uh, airline security security <laughs> counter type um, tool, and then you would kill all the parasites in those people, and therefore there would be no transmission from person to person. That's so simple; it seems a little bit outlandish, but but actually uh, there are field tests going on about that. And the the the, the one I like best was a, a proposal that was put forward by Lowell Wood, who is a brilliant scientist from the 
Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories. He was one of the last fellow postdoctoral fellows for Edward Teller. Uh, and he, he was actually the designer of the, of the Star Wars initiative in the U.S. where, you know, they would have uh, lasers that would uh, shoot down ballistic missiles that were being fired from Russia uh, to the United States. Um, this is back in the 70s when, when nuclear war was very much a possibility. So he applied the same logic to the mosquito. And he, 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 his idea was to create an electrical field between two telephone poles in a village. And this electrical field could differentiate mosquitoes from birds or butterflies or flies, could actually differentiate female from male mosquitoes on the basis of uh, wing beat frequency. And when the right mosquito came across, it was tied to a laser and <laughs> pulverized the mosquito. Actually, I saw a prototype of this, and there's nothing so satisfying as seeing a mosquito in mid-flight being pulverized. <laughs> but it's a crazy idea. But if you're going to get revolutionary innovation, you have to accept crazy ideas. The crazier idea, the crazier the idea, the more likely it's going to cause revolutionary innovation. You have to be willing to fail, take risks. You have to fail many times before you get successes. And so this was the, the basis of the Gates Foundation Grand Challenges Explorations Program, the idea that we would have many shots on goal for small amounts of money, and a few would come through and they would be truly revolutionary, and they would make a big difference for the world. Innovation is critical for what we do in medicine today. You know, if you make a new medicine and it's not really a game changer, there's no uptake. Many governments won't even give you a price for your medicines. There's no way to succeed in taking care of difficult problems unless you have true revolutionary innovation. Evolutionary innovation is not enough. When I think of the Alzheimer's treatments available today, they basically make your cognitive abilities improve just a tiny bit, maybe 10%. And that's all we have available for our patients today. That's not going to solve the problems of the world. Another very important lesson I learned is about partnership. You know, one of the very famous sayings of, uh, that I learned in, in the trip, one of my first trips to Kenya, was, uh, there's a poet there that, that basically wrote, if you want to go fast, travel alone. If you want to go far, travel together. The journey to creating meaningful solutions for patients with difficult, unmet needs is very far. You can't do it alone. The idea that a single person working in a laboratory can solve some major problem, that day is probably over. I know, for example, one of the most important successes we had at the foundation was the creation of a meningitis B vaccine. Here, there's a central African belt in Africa where meningitis every year or every other year would sweep through this belt, kill thousands of people, and more importantly, disable many others with seizures, mental deficits, uh, inability to ambulate after the infection. So the health ministers of those countries went to the World Health Assembly and, and demanded that something be done. The World Health Organization contacted, contacted us and asked us if we could help. We set up a target product profile for this product, and we said this product has to be almost 100% effective, and it has to be li provide lifelong protection, and it has to cost less than 50 cents. Almost an impossible task. But by partnering, by partnering 
with a Dutch company that had intellectual property that could be used by partnering with the FDA and the NIH that had very important other intellectual property that could be applied by partnering with PATH, an NGO, to help project manage this effort, by partnering with an Indian vaccine manufacturer, the Serum Institute of India. In seven years, we were able to make a vaccine that met that target product profile. And I was in Ouagadougou in 2010 when we launched that vaccine. Not possible without the partnerships that we had. And I gave the first, amongst the first doses of the vaccine to a young seven-year-old girl in in Burkina Faso. Uh, and I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'd never actually given a vaccine. Um, so I was very scared that I would screw something up. But I gave that little girl the vaccine. And uh, she didn't cry. She had a big smile on her face. And the sense I felt was a sense of accomplishment like I've never felt before. That everything I did in my life somehow built up to that moment in which I gave a vaccine that was going to have that girl smile, protected, hopefully, for the rest of her life. It was a great accomplishment. And it could not have been possible without the partnerships. Now, when I think about academia, I think of all the things that get in the way of partnerships. If you think about it, if you write a, a paper and you're not the first author or the last author, it might as well not be on your CV. Because anybody who looks at it says, oh, you were just a contributor. As if a contributor is a bad word. If you're a, a co-investigator on an NIH grant, do you get any credit for that grant? Of course not. Only the principal investigator gets credit for that grant. We have promotion systems that are based upon individual achievement, and partnership is not appreciated or recognized. If we're going to make progress in medical science, we have to create different incentive systems. And incentive systems have to be focused on how good a partner are you? How much can you contribute to everybody else's projects? It's not about the individual. It's about the productivity of the team. Somehow, we have to change that. The last lesson I learned, and a very important one, was about measurement. You know, when you're given away two, three billion dollars a year, as we were at the Gates Foundation, it's easy to think you're doing a good job just because you're given so much money. But you realize a lot of that money could be just going down a sinkhole, accomplishing nothing. So you actually have to actually measure the impact of what you're doing. The first CEO I worked for at Smith Klein Beecham was Jan Leslie. Jan Leslie, uh, before he was a pharmaceutical company executive, was a professional tennis player. And, actually reached the semifinals at the US Open. Great tennis player. And in our meetings, he used to say, if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. That's a very profound thing to say. I think a lot of us are just practicing most of the time, because we don't keep score. We don't say, how did this day make a difference? We have to think in terms of, understanding the impact of our work. If you're in academia, it's not enough to write a paper, get it published in the New England Journal or Science or Cell, to have an NIH grant, to get some prize or award. None of that matters if you haven't had an impact on life, if you haven't had an impact on people's lives. And actually, this is what governments and payers are asking us. Show us that what you're doing actually makes a difference to our patients. Because if you can't show that, we're not going to pay you. That's where the world is going today.
inappropriately so, we have to measure the impact of what we're doing. It's a critical element of life. It's a critical element that gives meaning to your life because it frames it in the context of what you have accomplished on the basis of its impact. So Bill Gates, uh, when he gave the graduation address at Harvard uh, a couple of years, several years ago, you know, he never graduated from Harvard. He finally got uh, an honorary degree, and that year he gave the graduation address. He said, humanity's greatest advances are not in its discoveries, but in how those discoveries are applied to reduce inequity. I think the challenge of global health is one of the greatest problems, the greatest challenges the world has ever faced. You know, the, the business of death and misery is stark and real. It's not about an NIH grant or, you know, what is your revenue from seeing patients or what are the awards you received. It's really about how do we create a world in which people have equal access to the best science and the best medicine. I'm really delighted that I believe it's possible to address these problems if people are willing to address them with a sense of urgency, with a an commitment to innovation, with an absolute willingness to partner, and with a desire to measure impact on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tashi. That was, as expected, spectacular. And I want to uh, mention that when you reach our age, as Barb reminded us, you refer to our relationship in decades, not in years. <laughs> um, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to see if we have any questions to start off with, because I want to give the audience an opportunity. So uh, we have a, where are the microphones? Yeah. So Sandeep has a question, Kerry. So thank you for a very enlightening talk. Uh, one issue that uh, you know I'm sure you've thought about, but kind of from from my perspective, having you know been born in India and then lived in the U.S., to me the next looming health crisis is really environmental, because you know when I go back to Delhi compared to when I grew up, I'm actually saddened by what progress has done to the country. I mean the air is virtually unbreathable, the water is undrinkable. And it's actually worse than Beijing. And there's really no uh, effort that I see in these local governments to address these issues, which you know I think are going to, beyond infectious diseases, become kind of the next wave of, of the, uh, healthcare burdens in the developing world. I was just well, interested in your well, there, thoughts on that. <clears throat> there's no question uh, that there are many problems in, in the world, certainly pollution, uh, environmental safety, uh, clean water, these are really important issues. And, and, and many of these issues are actually being addressed in a variety of different ways. For example, if you think about foreign aid uh, in, in, throughout the world, more than 80% of it goes to infrastructure, uh, building roads, cleaning up you know, waste, doing, uh, trying to create clean water and so on. Very little of it is actually spent on health, surprisingly, and even less of that health money goes to research. But, you know, if, if you think about the clean water problem, I, I think it's a huge problem. Um, the, the challenges of clean water is that they often cross borders, and so you can't have one government deal with it. You've got to have multiple governments deal with it. And, 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 and so, the aid that's gone towards this kind of stuff has been very difficult. From the standpoint, at least, of the Gates Foundation, the focus of the Gates Foundation was on research. And so, you know, what are the consequences of dirty water? Well, it's 
intestinal infection, and what can we do about that? How, do, how, how can we allow somebody to live in that environment? Probably through vaccines, and that's what we would do. But I understand that this is only a small part of the overall solution. Um, and, you know, if you think about the, the, the world today and say, what are the biggest challenges for the world? You'd have to say it's global peace and security. It has to be sustainable resources, and it has to be global health. Uh, and, and we just chose to play in that one space, global health. <clears throat> Let me let me uh, let me ask you a question, Tashi. Um, I mean, the, the the talk was inspiring and um, um, informative. Um, uh, this talk, this question really has to do with the responsibility of academic medical centers uh, in terms of dealing with global health problems. So you you bring a unique perspective because of all of the roles that you put yourself back at the University of Michigan when you were chair of medicine, but fast forward to 2014, when the country's going through the most monumental change in healthcare that I can remember. How would you balance, and I suspect you had some pressures on you when you were chair of the Department of Medicine at Michigan, how would you balance that with what you've learned about the urgency of some of these challenges in the, in the uh, developing world? Well, <clears throat> one of the things, I, f first of all, you know, <clears throat> academic medicine is very dependent upon the National Institute of Health, right? So um, it covers 90% of all the research money available. So it has to start at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, uh, let's just take the problem of Alzheimer's, and I'm sorry for fixating on Alzheimer's, but I think, I think Alzheimer's is probably the biggest challenge for the developed and probably the developing world in the future. That it, it, more than half of people over the age of, uh, of 80 are going to have cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's. More than half. Life expectancy is now approaching 80. So what does that mean? That half of the, you know, half of the people in their lifetimes are going to live with Alzheimer's or cognitive impairment. The cost to society and, 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 and the cost to human lives is unbelievable. And yet, in this year of the brain, they've set aside $10 million for Alzheimer's disease out of a $30 billion budget. So somewhere along the line, there has to be a reorientation. And the orientation has to be, what are the biggest problems? And, and why don't we put the, the most resources against those biggest problems? It's very hard to think of, of course, um, but I do think we have to prioritize how we spend our money to try to address some of the biggest problems. The second, I think, is, is really you know, the way we've structured department. I was a department chair. And, you know, one of the things we didn't like was the cancer center. Why? Because the cancer center was multidisciplinary. It took away some of my space and some of my authority. Well, if I had to do it over again, I would create a whole bunch of multidisciplinary centers, force partnerships, not allow people to sit in their individual labs doing their individual thing. I mean, you know, some of that's okay, but honestly, there has to be a way to get something with a whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. I think those are two critical resource allocation issues that I would revisit now if I went back to academic uh, academia. We had trouble doing that. What we tended to do was to feed our stars. We would always take the people with the most grants, the biggest reputations, we'd give them more space, and we didn't ask them to be citizens of the, of the university. They could do whatever the hell they wanted. And, 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 and we pay them more, and you know, we can't afford to do that anymore somehow. Questions? Eddie? Thank, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, my question is about educational partnerships, uh, as you mentioned. You know, one of the key components 
of getting stuff out into the field is increasing knowledge. And, and knowledge transfer uh, today is a huge thing. Have you thought about any revolutionary ways to grow educational partnerships <coughs> and knowledge that can be used most effectively and without taking people from other countries, bringing them here where they stay but never return where they're from or taking the knowledge in, from those places that you've been, that kind of thing. So how do we do that most yeah. effectively? This is something that, that I, uh, I, I thought a lot about, actually. Uh, you see, um, you have to have a system uh, of health care, and that health care is driven by software. And the software is driven usually by the academic institution and, or the educational institution. And, and so and how do we fix that? Actually, some of you may remember Joe Kolars, who's from here. I, uh, he was one of my uh, fellows at Michigan. And I convinced him to spend half of his time at the foundation thinking through what we might do in education. And he set up basically four different experiments in which there was twinning between uh, an academic institution and an African institution. Um, Unfortunately, we couldn't continue that program or expand it because the uh, financial crisis hit the Gates Foundation like it hit everybody else. And so we had to limit our programs. But what he did ended up in a new program that's co-sponsored by the NIH and the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, uh, that's going forward now uh, and grants are being made. But I, I do believe that this business of creating uh, a system of medical education. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Uh, simply clinical practice, but also research is critical for each of the countries. Uh, even the, the poorest country, uh, even the poorest countries need that. We have uh, Uh, thank you for the inspiration uh, presentation. And right now, uh, we know the lot of literature showing that the knowledge from the uh, research to the clinical practice translate into 17 years. There's a new uh, branch of the science called Science for Health Delivery. Mayo is have a new center for promote science health delivery. How do you see the future transfer? We know effective treatment. To, for example, the central line um, checklist that Peter Pornovo promote. You know how to apply not only U.S. not only Michigan how to apply globally efficiently, you know, just very simple, very effective way. We know that works, but haven't really been translated well through the process, you know. Yeah, that's a, a very complex and uh, important question. Um, in, in, the, in the case of maternal and child care, there's some simple solutions that can be applied, you know, warming the baby, cleaning the cord, uh, it, you know, just preventing, uh, infection through the skin, et cetera. Um, and what we, we have a number of projects that are ongoing in, in India uh, on this very, very issue. And, and we have enlisted the support of, uh, this is the Gates Foundation now, uh, Atul Gwande, who you're familiar with his checklist approach to the surgical OR. Your conference is now over. Goodbye. What we're trying to do is to create a checklist for <clears throat> maternal and child care.